so that you get some efficiency mm -hmm. out of it. But um, is there creative use of this methodology applied to private operations where the hidden costs or externalities mm -hmm. can be more visible mm -hmm. so that the public sector can hold accountable the private sector for the um, <coughs> external costs that are really uh, generated. Yeah, so I, I think that there, there, there definitely are adaptations and whole methodologies that have been developed to, to kind of try to understand what those externalities are, so what those kind of hidden costs, right, of, of private action, or even you know, of government action sometimes are. I, I think that there, those are available, um, and they can be very useful for that type of accountability that, that I think particularly as, as we think about prevention in, in the, the, the paper success case, where there is a private, a public private partnership, having a really thoughtful, transparent methodology in place and high quality economic evaluations is crucial to the success of any kind of creative financing of, of prevention. So uh, to kind of you know, bring that back. So I think that there, those methodologies are available. I think that they aren't always used and they're not always used correctly. Uh, but what we're seeing is as there's a particular prevention space, with increased interest, we're seeing increased scrutiny on methodologies being used, and I think that's a good thing for us to work. Yeah, I'm interested in your comment about the, your optimism about using administrative data sets. Because um, I was in a meeting. <laughs> yeah, and, and just if you can highlight some remedies um, in particular. I was in a meeting last week where um, a county commissioner was really talking about her difficulties in trying to um, look at the effects of a preventive intervention being offered to families that are in the child welfare system being served through the courts and her inability to get educational and Medicaid data about those same families without a unique identifier. Yeah. And to do that at a population level beyond just the families being served by this particular court. Um, so, can you highlight any local areas where people have really had some successful remedies in linking yeah. some of these sets? I think I, think I can, and I'm sure that other, other people can as well. I think that there's the kind of maybe one of the elements in the room around administrative data is that right now, accessing administrative data sets, not even speaking to the quality, but just getting that access, there are some perverse um, incentives, I guess, in place where it's, it's to do nothing, to sit on that data for an agency or a group is almost no risk, right? But but to, to allow someone access to it, especially allow any kind of identifies that is the perception is that there's tremendous risk, right? Uh, in opening up that, those data sets. One of the things that prevention brings to the table, and it, especially as we found the, the importance of emphasizing the use of administrative data, is that it kind of starts to turn that on its head in the incentive is if we don't have that data to evaluate, we're wasting, we're losing money, and we don't know if we're helping people. And so the risk of inaction starts to become greater than the, the risk of allowing people to use those data. So that's that's kind of the broader perspective that, that I hold in that area. Um, I do think that there's some you know, examples, and I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. Uh, I, I'm at Duke you know, in North Carolina, and we've had a lot of success in, in social services, and as well as with um, our education data. We, you know, I think Medicaid data is, is another space, and the uh, ResDAC has you know, so made some real strides in terms of trying to open that up. Of course, it's not, it's still delayed. We can use it when people can access it, so it's not useful, it's useful for real time decision making at this moment. But I think it, it shows promise. I'm happy to talk about the oversight stuff. So, um, I just want to uh, sort of ask your thoughts for at least on like, the Institute of Medicine's uh, forum on uh, preventing child emotional mental emotional behavioral disorders in children. Um, and Professor Neil Hoffman talked a lot about, and others hit on the idea of raising the mean. Um, that sort of community idea of, of uh, getting sort of its mean indicators up. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if your thoughts about tying back these sort of ideas about uh, return on investment to ideas of raising the mean. That seems like a reasonably resonant idea that uh, promotes sort of communitarian thought. Yeah, 
Yeah, definitely. I think that this idea of kind of ra raising the, the mean is a very, it's known value in the sense that we have the opportunity to help everyone. And when we talk about universal prevention in particular, opportunities for light touch programs that, for instance, in the substance use prevention, what we see is a lot, that we can provide uh, coverage for a lot of people for a very low cost, and we can truly can't change the mean for population. I think that uh, when we, that, that there's huge value there in terms of return on investment, when, when we balance kind of what the return is and what the expectations are. Sometimes the, the time horizon, right? So how long we're going to wait till we get those benefits can get in our way. But sometimes, but that's not always true. As we've developed more and more efficient universal prevention programs that can both raise the need, but do so for a low cost, I think that we're, basically the idea is we're getting there um, in that case. So some of the programs I, I talked about were more targeted, and so you wouldn't necessarily see a mean change in a true population sample. But you would in, for instance, the child welfare system, which you were saying there. Is that kind of I think that we're probably 